Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Raven Maureen and today I am sharing a requested video. Someone asked me for ways to turn your sewing into a side hustle, but I'll put it to you like this. I actually don't use the term side hustle anymore. I use streams of income or monetization. So let's get into it. I've come up with six ways. Most of them I've already done, but I'm sharing my wisdom and a little bit of my story. So Let's start at the top. So number one, you can sell your items. You can do e-commerce or in person. This is something that I have done in the past. This is something that I started doing again this year. So many of you may not know that I started my Instagram journey by selling handbags and small zipper pouches and whatnot on Etsy. And it was recommended to me that I actually start my Instagram account to grow that customer um, reach. So in essence, I decided to do the coin pouches and then Instagram was the vessel, right? So I say all that to say that there's Shopify these days, there's um, Etsy, there's so many different avenues where you can really share your craft and it doesn't have to be zippers or coin pouches. It could be crocheting, it could be knitting, it could be you know clothes that you've already made, it could be a shawl, it could be a scarf, it could be whatever that you know how to make well and that you want to make over and over again because believe me if you're successful you'll be making it over and over and over again um but monetize that and use that now does it take capital of course does it take time away from other things that you may want to do of course but with a different stream of income is going to come sacrifice but also growth and development and more money in your pocket in the end um and then along with the e-commerce way you can also do an in-person and you can honestly do hybrid you can do both and when i was selling my coin pouches i did both because it was supplemental income either way and um if you watched my weekly vlog videos you you'll know that i signed up for a couple of craft fairs this year because it is an additional stream of income it's a way to get in front of the customer where they can touch it they can feel it and you can actually start to gain almost a local following people start to ex expect to see you especially at the marketplaces that happen periodically or every other weekend or however that cadence is so when you're doing something in person um, I have a couple of like I guess rules that I follow for myself so I always see like how much is that booth fee right and how many days is it so for me my bar is that I do not spend over $75 for a single day event. That's in my city. If you live in a large metropolitan area where the population is huge and the sales opportunities could be endless, that bar could be a little bit higher for you because that space could actually cost more for the overall event, right? Um, if it's over a period of days, I draw the line between like 150 and 300. 150 for the weekend, 300 if it's four days or so. Again, this is all based on where you live, what those hours are like, what that customer base is like. And when you are signing up for these craft fairs, the earlier, the better, right? But at the same time, I say ignore the deadlines. I actually signed up for a couple of mine a little bit late and they got back to me and they were able to slide me in. Um, and then once you kind of get in one or two of them, other people will start to reach out and say, hey, I heard that you were a vendor at this event. Would you be interested in buying a spot over here? Because the one thing that vendors or craft shows don't want are empty spaces. So even if you sign up late, it's a space that they have filled. So never think that it's too late or that you're signing up even too early. Because sometimes you can even get on an email list and find out when to do the application. I also suggest that if you're going to do something in person, have your pictures ready they want to see what you're going to sell because at the end of the day they don't want someone out there selling something that's inappropriate or even something that could compete with another category so like when i was filling out my applications this year the lady you know she asked me specifically she's like what are you going to be selling and i was like oh well handmade items and she's like right but what is it so i let her know it would be you know coin pouches small handmade accessories and she's like okay good she's like I just want to make sure I won't have 
10 soap ladies at the same venue. So you have to be mindful of your competition. A lot of times these craft shows may not want the same person or the same category and kind of oversaturate an area or whatnot. Um, if there's someone who is in your market or in your niche, make friends with them. Like don't really think of them as like your total competition. Make friends, find out how long they've been doing it, what the day is like, what has it been like in the past? And that, and then you can kind of gauge the crowd. And the other thing I will say about craft shows, once you're there, really, again, make friends with the people around you. Take notes on how they set up things. Research ahead of time how to set up something. Read the fine print over all of the contracts and whatnot. Make sure you're paying all your taxes and fees and that you're within compliance about your space, what time you need to be there to set up. All of these things will make a huge difference as far as if you're going to be asked back the next year and if you can be asked again for another event by another craft show because they all talk right especially in smaller towns um so i would say definitely make friends um network and even come up with sales on the fly like my first craft show that i did it was actually a really big one um now that i look back on it and i was very lucky that they were able to have me and it was in aiken south carolina and it was like their major holiday event it was my first craft fair but i had been selling on etsy for quite a long time at that point so i kind of just set up like a little booth area in my apartment at the time and i was like here's everything i want to be selling here's an example of my booth so even if you've never actually ever done a booth clear your dining room table put your stuff on display as if it were a booth take pictures send it in you're good to go and the other thing is is that even though i closed that shop i actually never deleted those pictures so i always kept them and it worked out in my favor because when it was time for me to sign up for those craft shows again this year i had the pictures ready to go and although i won't be selling the exact same thing because some of that fabric is no longer available it will be in that same vein number two teach classes so this is something that i've done as well um so let me tell you you can teach classes through zoom you can make it digital you can have a subscription you can teach it right here on youtube gain a following and as long as you're consistent and you grow your audience then you can have a consistent class um during 2020 there was a huge boom of folks that decided to take their classes out of in-person and go on zoom and it worked out in their benefit and they're still thriving in that space today so there's no reason why you can't get on your zoom <laughs> and actually start setting something up especially if people have already reached out because they know that you sew and they're like i would love to learn from you that is usually like the the light bulb that goes off that like hey maybe i should start teaching this so I would say there's Vimeo if you just want to do like pre-recorded uh, videos and have it like password protected if you wanted to do it that way. Again, Zoom, you can do it live and have it in, you know, however many increments that you want, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, open session, that kind of thing. People can pay you through all these different money apps, right? And you can let them into your class. Uh, I would also say because COVID, yes, COVID is on the rise, but we are in the endemic stage of it. Having an in-person class is not necessarily frowned upon. People love in-person. They want to get back to that. And I would look to your local community centers, the Y, even your local Joann's or any other crafts spaces or creative centers to host those classes. Um, you would be amazed and surprised at how many people would show up and, you know, always have a plan. So I'll tell you this. I used to hire and manage substitute teachers maybe five years ago, and it was for obviously a school system. And in my cubicle at the office, I had my quilts that I made on the walls because I wanted something really pretty to look at. Well, the after school program lady, her cubicle was right across from mine. And she realized or she noticed the the quilts that I had in my cubicle. And she was like, did you make those? And I was like, oh, yeah. So she started talking to me and she was a really sweet lady. And I've lost touch with her, but very, very nice. And she, you know, would 
kind of see me walk by every day and like something that I made and whatnot. And we really developed a relationship and there was a spot available in the after school program. And she was like, do you ever teach kids how to sew in, in person? And I had never done it, but I love kids. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I said, yes, um, not really realizing what I was getting into, but she was like, okay, well, you know, we need to come up with like a, it was almost like a, a presentation or a proposal in order to get the funding for this. So I was able to tell her what projects we would come up with. So some of the projects that I had the kids do were like pillows and um, there was some other like random things that I had them do. But either way, we didn't have sewing machines like at all. So I was using fabric glue with these kids and I was teaching them right sides together, you know, take your finger, draw the glue, put your pillow on. And it was probably one of the most fulfilling, wonderful experiences I've ever had in my life. Like even when the kids were bad, I loved them. <laughs> and and it got to the point where they were like looking forward to my class. They were looking forward to the after school program and just seeing the creativity come alive with them. Like, you know, they were picking out their own ideas. They were picking out their own colors. And fun fact, when I was teaching that class, I actually put a call out in my Instagram stories like, hey, I'm going to be teaching this class. If anyone knows where I can get fab fabric scraps or like how I can work that out, let me know. When I tell you I had people sending me fabric scraps for those kids, I had boxes coming to my house every week for those kids. And it was like, when I tell you the sewing community is real, it's real. And unfortunately, the program ended due to COVID because it was in the uh, 2019 to 2020 school year. So like 2020, when we got back from break, obviously COVID was like on the uptick in other parts of the country. And then by like February and March, they had totally canceled the class. But I say all that to say that in that small period of time, I was able to name my price. I was able to develop a proposal. I was able to get the supplies and I was able to, again, have another stream of income. And I enjoyed every bit of it. So don't underestimate your local schools, your local craft centers or anything like that. Number three, work in a craft store. So we all know that there are big box stores everywhere. You may even have some local craft stores in your area that are not associated with any sort of corporation. I would encourage you that, you know, the best way to maybe enjoy a second job if you have retail experience is to work in that environment. Um, so I have never worked in a craft store um, not because I look down on it, not at all. Um, but I did come across, it's a Project Runway winner. His name is Aaron Michael. He was on the same season as Katie Cortman. Well, he actually lives out here in Jackson, Mississippi. And I have run into him a few times at Joann's. And he had told me during one of our visits at Joann's that we've run into each other. He had actually told me that prior to Project Runway, he worked at Joann's to save and get the discount on the fabric. Now, this is a guy that was on TV as a reality star and said, I'm going to do what I can to get my hustle on. And he did that. And don't knock that. That person that is cutting fabric today could be you tomorrow. Number four. So this is something that we all kind of like giggle about like, oh, I don't do alterations. Oh, I don't sew for hire. But baby... There's a market for that because there is um, there are several sewists. There's one that comes to mind. I can't think of her name right now, but she does these videos on Instagram where she'll be like, a client reached out to me, right? I think her name is Mon Mondez Threads or something like that. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but she'll be like, a client reached out to me. This is her whole business. Like she literally makes alterations on dresses that people buy on like Timu and Wish and Amazon that are poorly fitted or don't work out and she'll like gather those dresses make it work for the client and she has built an entire following an entire business off of it so do not knock sewing for hire shoot I've even done alterations I was um I was living in an apartment complex and the maintenance guy knew 
that I um, sewed because I was always getting packages. So he um, he was like, hey, I have some work pants. He was like, I really need this pocket fixed. So I fixed the pocket for him, charged him $10. That was $10 that Uncle Sam did not touch. And I mean, I didn't continue doing it, but it is something you can do. Now, this is where like the sew for hire and the selling your items combined. So in 2020, I was furloughed from that same school system because of COVID, right? And immediately I just snapped into action and I was like, I'm going to start selling masks. So I didn't put anything in my Etsy shop. I literally put a status on Facebook and was like, hey, you guys, I'm selling masks. DM me if you want one. And I put like, literally, I was like, you can get five for 25. You can get three for 30. Like I literally, not three for 30. I think it was like three for 15, five for 25. Like I made it a whole thing, right? I was like, you can get two kids free, two free kids masks when you buy 10. Like I had a whole, a whole special, right? In an hour, I had like 20 orders in my DM. And I was like, oh, you can cash at me. You can Venmo me, PayPal me. When I tell you that in 2020, I doubled what I was making as a recruiter and account manager for the school system off masks. Off masks. People were looking for those masks. And they they kept coming back too like they were asking and asking and asking so yes that was a state of an emergency literally but if you can solve a problem solve a need for a community for a body of people regardless of it being a pandemic you can make money off that number five social media so this one might be controversial but go along with me here. So do I make money off every post? Absolutely not. But do my posts help me to stay in the realm so that people can see me and they, I'm front of mind so that they can buy my product? Yes. So with social media, your gains are not going to be instant at all right? But what I have learned throughout the years with social media is that when you when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So with Instagram and Meta and TikTok and even YouTube to a certain extent, they roll out these different programs and they say, hey, we're testing this or hey, you've been selected to be beta for this or whatever. They usually choose people who are more active and get more traction on their posts. So I say all that to say that monetization programs that come through on these social apps um, usually go to the people that are at the top of the algorithm that are constantly posting, that are consistent in their, in their um, activity on there. That's true. So again, let's go back to 2021 when Instagram was paying folks for reels. If you were already producing reels and in that habit, Instagram was reaching out like, hey, set up your account, get paid for reels. And for about a year, we were getting paid on reels. Um, so I say that, yes, for a year, was I getting paid on every post? No. But when they opened that program, was I one of the first people to be asked? Yes. And you never know where your post could lead. So this is, I believe wholeheartedly in this. You never know who's watching. You never know where your post could lead. Um, so there was a company, I think it was called Hearts Fabric. Literally one of the first things I ever made like on the internet, right? And it was a set of overalls. It was the Burnside bibs. I made them in this blush pink. It went viral. And that was how Gabriella from Chalk and Notch found me. And to this day, her and I still have a working relationship. You just never know who's watching. You never know who's paying attention, good, bad, or indifferent. You just never know. Um, and it has led to so many opportunities, meeting so many great people, 
and just being part of a community. So even if your posts are not doing as well as you would like them to be, you're still part of the community. You're still engaging. You're still relevant. You're still at the top of somebody's list. So even if you're just like, Ugh, you know, I can't really get into the social media thing. There's too many apps to choose from. Find one app that you love. And if you have time to use that one app and engage, you know, a couple of times a week, get into a cadence and do that and just kind of get into the repetition of it start a blog blogs still make money you guys i promise you um do those things get recognized get noticed join a community those things can those things can take you so far and when you want to start to sew for hire start a business you know selling items those things will become easier because you have already built your community so Social media is not the root of all evil. Now, do people use it for bad things? Absolutely. But there's so much good out there that you can really change your life. So number six, digitizing patterns. So this is something, so jumping off of social media, building that community, building that following, say you want to digitize patterns, say that you have learned how to pattern mix some in some sort of class or through Adobe Illustrator and you decide to digitize your patterns. Perfect avenue to share and advertise for that. Um, and that's a lot of way that that's a that's a lot of I'm sorry, digitizing patterns is a is a big way that people make money while sleeping. I'll put it to you like that. So you don't have to sit there and make anything. You've already made it. People are just buying it because it's a digital copy. Number seven, work for a company. So as you know, I work for Design Group, but there are several, um, I guess you can call them fashion houses, <laughs> where they hire social media help. Friday Pattern Company, I think I saw Cashmere Red was looking for somebody. Um, I know Closet Core has looked for someone in the past. So and uh, Chalk and Notch, she has someone who helps with the social media stuff. So there's a lot of pattern companies that are looking for that social media help. And if you have built your following on Instagram, if you have a portfolio of things to show, hey, I know how to do this. I've been doing this for a long time. People, again, will reach out, look at your community, look to your community to see who can help you. So um, there are, I said I had six. I just listed seven ways that you can make money or make additional streams of income with sewing. Um, so one thing I did want to share because I feel like it's really appropriate to do that now is that um, I told you guys like probably a few months ago, like I can't wait to share my story, but it all ties in together with this theme tonight about how to monetize your, your, um, your craft and whatnot. So like basically I went on my honeymoon got back from my honeymoon and my company eliminated my position. So this could have been terrible. Could have been awful. It could have meant bad things for my household and for my family. But weeks before that, the internship was already in the works. I had already been working on my pattern weights. I was already on the cusp of being monetized with YouTube and literally when I was let go or my position was eliminated, I sprung into that same action that I had when I lost my job when I was furloughed and I was making masks. It's, it was like the same reflex. It was like, okay, I know what to do. So I say all that to say that one, timing is everything. But if you are working and walking in your purpose, God is going to take care of the rest. So have faith, develop those streams of income, get your community ready and go ahead and change your life. Um, so that's all I have for you guys tonight. Thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're not following me already, you can follow me at Raven Maureen on Instagram, threads and TikTok. See you next time. Bye.